Suffix. So I was talking to my uncle, who works in electronics. As we were conversing, he mentioned a time when he disassembled a flat screen TV and found a device on the back of the screen on the inside, disguised as an electronic. But when he investigated further, he found it had the components to cause the TV to flash at whichever rate its operator would choose to flash the screen at. Before everyone starts thinking subliminal messages, it wasn't as technical as that, he said. But to make it a long story short, it should not have been on a TV. What would its purpose be? He made a call to the manufacturer, I think it was Samsung, and asked questions. It took him a while to find someone that actually even knew about what he was talking about. I would suppose he climbed the ladder of seniority and company secrets. The guy was frank about it. He said it was part of what made Samsung TVs better than their competitors, and dropping the issue altogether would be most beneficial to both of them. Being an ex-marine with actual intellect, he was adamant about getting him to say what it was for, and knowing how government secrets work, he said he was not going to stop for the likes of a company whose intentions might be deeper than what he discussed. The employee or executive told him he was busy, had to go, and if he would send it to their HQ, Samsung would have sent him their newest and best TV in exchange for the one he had. In the following days after, everything was normal until he was taking a bus home, who had a dude in a suit just sitting there. Now he lives in a city with a bunch of Mexicans by the border. No one fucking can afford a suit or even wants to, and who would wear one on a bus? Not racist, just fact. So he gets off, and as he gets up, the suit guy does too, and tries to talk to him. He kindly asks him to stop worrying about it, as it does not concern him, and what he was told on the phone was not true. He plainly told him, It's a device that allows an aspect of the television screen to oscillate at a frequency similar to human brain waves. The last part of what he said freaks me out the most. He continued, It's usually off. Being as he only wanted an answer to what it was, he stopped asking what its purpose was for. However, I wouldn't doubt that the way he was approached by the guy in a suit let him in on how deep the pile of shit he was stepping into actually was. Also, because he was in the military, he is fond of knowing what the government is actually doing. But whenever I bring up UFOs, he tells me, that's crazy talk, don't make me kick your ass. TLDR, IMO, there is a chance your flat screen has a transponder that allows you to be influenced by whoever wants to influence you based on your brainwaves. My work stories. Don't care if you believe me or not, just sharing. Hey guys, I'm an ex-marine, turned into a private security slash contractor, and I'm going to share some work stories with you guys that happened when I was working on shithole jobs. Be me, ex-marine, now working security for a contracting company, patrolling slash guarding some hospital in some foreign country, which I will not disclose. Here's the layout. Normal hospital above ground. State of the art. Has lower levels which only high-clearance personnel are allowed to enter, and are security kept in. No idea what happens in those lower labs, nor does anyone really working above ground. Above ground security is permitted use of patrolling with holstered PSM 5.45s, free round burst slash single shot. Above ground, behind two clearance doors and one checkpoint, is an armory for extra security, which contains one rack of PP-19s and another rack of body armor. Are we police? Only access to lower levels is one security elevator, and a ladder in the elevator shaft leading to the lower levels. Literally unable to open this elevator without the right clearance. Our captain always messes with us, telling us they do unworldly experiments down there, creating human slash animal hybrids. This is the type of shit we do to pass the time, as we work 14 hour shifts, literally patrolling this hospital, looking important. I'm American originally, so a lot of the doctors Girls in the hospital are always Myron. My codename in detail is Playboy, or at least that's the nickname I was assigned, because I always spend the days flirting with the hot secretaries and doctors. Literally the only time we see anyone leaving from this one lift to the lower levels is during the late hours of the night, or arriving in the early mornings in groups, usually. They never talk to anyone or make eye contact. We always thought of them as snobs. Apparently, our captain disclosed to us off the record that there is a special security force operating on the lower levels. One night, in the middle of winter, we are working, 12 of us total on security detail at the time. Other than us 12, there is just secretaries and patients waiting for transfer 
and nurses on hand throughout the hospital. In case of lower level emergency, our protocol is to lock down the lift housing slash security hub section of the building to separate us from the rest of the hospital. The only way we knew when to lock down was that the lower level would signal up to us and our building's lighting would turn an emergency red. Only one comm center from above ground to bottom, which is manned at all times and only used in extreme cases of emergency. Only one way, lower to upper. The way we locked down was by dropping a steel gate over the bridge slash walkway on both ends and signaling the main hospital security that our section was on lockdown. They'd then make sure their end was locked down and separated from us. Not once in the four years I worked this job did we have a lockdown happen besides once. This is the story I'm going to share. As I said, one night in the middle of winter, 12 of us are working detail. Seven of us are sitting at the checkpoint area, playing cards and having fun, just generally trying to kill time. Our captain is with us. Over five are on patrol throughout the rest of our sector of the building. We're sitting there, shooting the shit, when suddenly, our main building's lighting flicks over to the emergency red. Our captain stops mid-sentence and looks up at the light. His mouth is open, with an amazed look on his face. He stutters. Uh, uh, fuck, lockdown, now, get this place secure, move your asses, in his stupid accent. We're all like, what the fuck is the deal? We're taking our sweet time, and we hear our captain over our comms. Hurry up and get to the armory entrance, ASAP. We're all in panic mode now, not knowing what the fuck is going on. The emergency lights are flashing, and our side is locked down. Me and another kid on detail finish up locking down our section, proceed to rush over to the armory entrance. Everyone is there and panicking, besides Captain and these two dudes in uniform. Everyone is like, who the fuck are these two guys? This guy named Piper pipes up and says, Uh, Captain, who are these two? Our Captain gulps and stutters again. Our, uh, supervisors. They'll be taking over from here on out. They never gave us their names, so besides from their stupid fucking suits and accents, I have nothing else to describe them by, so we'll call them Suit 1 and Suit 2. Suit 1 pipes up, go, and motions towards the armory. Our captain then yells, move it, let's go. We rush into the armory, and our captain starts handing out PP-19s and body armor. Not once in my time working this job before that night did we have to do any of this, besides opening their training. Suit 1 says, move to elevator now. Suit 2 says, and motions towards our captain, slash comms officer, and some expert. You free, with me, now. They move into the security room, opposite of the elevator. Suit 1 says, rest of you, with me. We go to the elevator. Suit 1 starts positioning us like a squad leader. American and Anon, you go right corridor, positioned by bench. You five, with me, in front of elevator. You two, cover left corridor. Weapons ready. Weapons ready basically means to raise your weapons. We see suit 2 behind the security glass, using the emergency comms. Our captain and the other two with them have looks of dread on their face. The glass room is soundproofed. Only way sound can escape to the lobby is if it's buzzed in through a calm on the window. Suit 2 buzzes into suit 1. Alright, get ready. Lift on route. This is the first time we've seen suit 1 break posture. He kind of looks gassed. He quickly regains his posture. Ready up. Focus. If I say so, you shoot. Okay? We nod. We see the elevator in use sign lit up. Suit 1 is visibly sweating. Beret behind glass is freaking out on our captain while motioning towards the elevator frantically like an argument. Our captain visibly trying to calm him down. Calms guy is bitching at suit 2 while suit 2 continues looking steadily towards the elevator holding comms in hand. Beret was usually the most badass composed of us all. Never seen him like this. I look towards one of the five around suit one, and I notice three are looking at me with the what the fuck is going on looks on their faces. Suit one finally breaks the awkward silent halt and draws a holstered weapon, which I did not notice that he had, and points it towards the elevator. I notice suit two reach down to buzz our lobby calm. He says, suit one, are we ready? Suit two replies, we are go. We have no idea how deep the shaft is, or how long it takes the elevator to get from top to bottom. We can hear cracks and clacks coming from the shaft. Sounds like distant gunshots. 
we hear rattling and the sound of screeching metal coming through. I assume the screeching metal is the outer walls of the elevator being forced against the walls of the elevator shaft. The door to the elevator opens, and it's pitch black within the elevator. No one can tell what they're looking at. It's pretty much a black mass, or even better described as a void. Suit 1 is shaking, and my captain's mouth, along with everyone's behind the glass, is just wide open. Everybody slowly lowers their weapons, and some even mutter, What the fuck? We all stare at this black void, not knowing what to do. Suit 1 tries to yell, Fuck! A loud screech rings out from the mass, causing us to hurl over and hold our hands to our ears in panic. Most of us lose composure and drop our weapons. Suit 1 holds posture and rings off a couple shots. The shrieking gets immensely louder until we are all eventually on the ground. We are all hurled on the floor, besides everyone behind the glass. Our captain is visibly shaking. Suit 2's mouth is completely open. The CO is pretty much shivering in a corner. The beret is not any better off. One of the five with suit one reaches for his weapon. We all follow. It is now completely silent, besides from our groans and people panicking and yelling. What the fuck do we do? Suit one raises his weapons and yells once again, Open fire, fuckers! We raise our weapons, and we all empty a full magazine, not knowing if we actually did anything. From what it looked like, from my perspective, it pretty much appeared that we were just emptying ammo into a dark room. Finally, someone yells, What the fuck are we shooting at? Suit 1 finally breaks composure and looks back at Suit 2. What the fuck do we do? The void begins to expand outwards into the corridor. Suit 2 is now pale as a sheet. He manages to buzz out. Oh, fuck, fire, kill it. By now, we finish reloading and begin emptying another clip into the void. The more we fired into it, the more it expanded, like the fucking blob from Ghostbusters. One of the four in detail in the left corridor lost composure and said, Fuck this, got up and ran. Most of us were scared shitless and had no idea what was going on. We were just mindlessly firing because we were told to. I then look into the void, like I look deeply into it. I notice that it's not just black in the void, and if you actually look in, you can see things. I look in, and I see little specks of light, grey slash bluish slash reddish colours, swirling around. It was really mesmerizing. Suit 1 breaks the fascination and yells at the unit who broke formation. Get back here or face sentence. Out of nowhere, we hear a snap and the elevator violently jerks to downwards. The elevator begins to make the groaning sound that steel makes when bending. We then hear a loud snap and the elevator begins to fall. We hear nothing but the sound of screeching metal for about 10 seconds, eventually followed by a distant crash. The metal doors of the lift begin to close. Everyone is visibly scared and shaking. Suit 1 is bent over, gasping for breath, and the foreign unit who fled was in the back corner of the corridor, puking. Out of nowhere, about 20 to 40 suits begin coming from the supposed lockdown walkway, rushing in and securing the area. We were all quickly taken separately to different undisclosed locations and debriefed on not to share this with anyone. Our contract is then ended and given a lump sum pay, and from what I heard from one of the guys that I kept in contact with from the detail, they hired 32 new contracts for detail. No idea what the black void was. No idea what happened in the underground facility. No idea who the fucking suits were. Never met my captain again. Was flown back to America within three days. Listed my new application with Blackwater. Blackwater goes to shit. Now I'm just a jobless gun for hire, sharing my stories with friends and random people on 4chan. Go to school, kids. This isn't mine, but I'll share something that I witnessed during a group regression. This is 100% true, although I'm not sure how interesting it is to other people. We'll green text, because it's a little long. I started seeing a past life regression therapist a couple of years ago. It was a weird time in my life. Therapist's name is Maggie, and she's cool. Did a chakra healing on me once. We were both actually kind of skeptical. Me because I didn't just believe in it, and her because it would be her first time doing it on a client. The effects were astounding, and if you're interested, I can share my experience. But the point here is, I started out a skeptic about what I considered woo-woo bullshit, but came out a bit of a believer. Anyway, 
Maggie has a group session coming up one weekend, and I decide to attend. Small group, only about ten of us. We are all hanging out in this crystal shop as Maggie prepares the space where we will be doing the regression. I'm observing everyone. One guy just stands out. He's super fit, tall, and does not seem to be the type to be into the shit. He also looks pretty uncomfortable. At one point, he gets a phone call that seems to worry him. He's asking, are you okay? Do you have a ride? Etc. This is a small shop, so we can all hear this. There is a pause, and the guy seems confused. Then kind of aggravated. Then he hangs up. Then Maggie leads us all to move into a small room for the session. We introduce ourselves. The guy who got the phone call tells us he's an ex-marine. He was only here as moral support for his wife, but she got a flat on the freeway, en route to the session. She called him, and told him to please sit in for her. He didn't want to, because, to be honest, I just don't believe in this stuff. Relevant to the story is one of a girl that I had also noticed. A very pretty, Argentinian girl with long black hair who looked like a young Marissa Tomei. She said she'd never done past life regression, but that her friend, who was next to her, convinced her to come. She was religious and believed in heaven, but was not sure she believed in past lives, but was open to it. Anyway, the session begins, and it goes the way a lot of men went. I find it hard to get hypnotized, but it leaves me feeling relaxed, no visuals. The session ends, and Maggie asks us all to share how it went. Everyone else has a pretty cool experience, but the ex-marine and Marissa Tomei share some really wild shit. So the ex-marine says he saw himself in two different lifetimes, and that he was killed in both by his father. The first time, he was ten years old, somewhere in the Middle East. His father was dragging him out into the wilderness. He felt scared. Everyone thought he was a witch, and his father was being forced to leave him out in the middle of nowhere. The lifetime ended, and the ex-marine was taken to another life. He was again a young boy, and his own father killed him because he had the ability to see illnesses and heal them. The neighbors were frightened by this, and his father and the others burned him alive, if I recall correctly. Then he heaved a huge sigh and said, I still have this ability. He went on to say that as a boy, in this life, he and his father would go on walks. He would point to people and say, Daddy, that man has a problem with his heart, or that man has a pain in his leg, etc. His dad actually believed in supernatural abilities and told him that it meant he was supposed to help people. I forget exactly why, but there was an important moment that made him turn his back on all of that and choose the military. As he was telling us all of this, the Argentinian girl was whispering to her friend a lot, and Maggie asked her to share. She said she had seen one of her past lives, and she had lived in this little village. She was very poor and had a son. Her husband and other children had died, and he was all she had left. She took him to a healer. The healer cured her son, and he lived to grow into an old man. She died with him at her bedside. The whole time she's telling the story, she keeps looking over at the ex-marine. By the end of it, she's staring at him, and tears are filling her eyes. I'm not making this up. I know it sounds melodramatic, but it's just how it happened. She then describes this healer, and the ex-marine's face is going beet red. He says, that was me, and she just nods her head, and is full on crying. The two of them get up and embrace each other. It probably sounds cheesy to read, but it was very moving in the moment. Maggie asked the ex-marine if he believed he still had this power to heal. I can't remember his exact response, but I'm pretty sure he implied that he had actually cured his own dad of something. That's pretty much all there is. I wish I could remember what he said made him join the military. There's a big piece in the middle that I'm missing. Be me. Ex-marine working security detail for some off-the-grid company. Me and about 12 other guys assigned to patrol slash monitor the upper levels of some medical building. Not allowed to go to lower levels. Not high enough clearance. Two elevators leading to lower levels. No stairs. Asked to inform the patrols whenever someone is coming up those elevators. It's 2 a.m. and no one is supposed to be in the lower labs. My face when I see the elevator in use light up at the security desk. All patrols, we have the lower level elevators currently in use past the designated time. Can anyone check it out? Patrol replies, I'm near. I'll head over and see what's up. Watching patrol near elevators on security cam. Elevator opens. Pitch black inside elevator. Like, literally pitch black. You can't see an inch in. Usually, the elevators are lit up. Patrol sounds over radio. Fuck. 
see him raise his gun on Cam. Get on radio. All patrols to lower level access elevators ASAP. Actually was pretty good friends with this guy, so I pick up my gun and begin rushing towards elevator. Me and everyone else gets there. Weapon raised. See elevator is still pitch black. Our flashlights are not penetrating the darkness. Patrol who responded to check out elevator comes out of nowhere from behind us. Says, what's going on? We are all looking at him. Everyone's looking at me now. We look back at the elevator. Lights flicker on and elevator closes, going back down to labs. Everyone heard fuck over the radio, and when we reviewed the footage, it clearly showed the one patrol approaching the elevator. The thing is, on the video, the patrol has his gun raised and enters the elevator. Upon entering it, the elevator closes and reopens as soon as I turn the corner on the cam. The company we were working for reviewed the footage and paid us off, and we were all transferred the next day, besides the patrol that was seen entering the elevator on cam. Before we begin, welcome to Whidbey Island, a real place in the USA. Feel free to Google map to your heart's content and familiarize yourself with this very unique island, for I have a story never before told brewing from the mixed and mangled memories of my mind. And finally, nearly four years later, after some therapy and some help, I finally begun mustering up the courage to write everything down and get this thing off my chest once and for all. My typing is far from the speediest. I appreciate your patience, but here are some cool facts about Whidbey. Has one of the oldest air runways built ever in the US. Has a naval base, but built another base back during World War II. Mostly woods slash forestry. Fog is a common thing here that stretches to nearly every corner of the island. Wolves and large cats have been spotted on Whidbey, as well as other wild creatures. Free bus service. Wonderful tourist trap. Largest town's population breached only 4,000 people. Pick is very relevant. That is me. The artist that is in a recreational group from medieval times. This is how I vent my anger and how I saved my life nearly four years ago. Now, onto the story. It was my birthday, hanging near the end of October, back when I lived in Skagit Head, just hardly 300 yards from the cliffside that towered over the beaches on the bottom side of the island, which is for the most part filled with forestry. I remember the closest street lamp was a 30 minute walk away, making going to and from work a bloody nightmare during the winter months. Hawaii Lane. Google it if you are still suspicious. And rather than have a big old party with the family, I was too busy being preoccupied with something I am passionate about, helping others. Whidbey is practically a no-job zone, unless you are one of the lucky ones. Many leave the island and head to Seattle just for work. My roommates luckily were able to keep a roof over our heads, and I contributed by doing countless hours of volunteer work, which enabled me to bring free food home, as well as borrow tools to help out with landscaping maintenance and other things. And even though I did not have a job, I still managed to bring a sense of income home. I fix computers and or revive ancient machines and make them work again for basic use. I had finished tuning up an ancient optiplex and already called its owner to have it picked up, but seeing that was not going to be for another couple of hours, I decided to walk to the cliffside and see the space needle across from the pungent sound. I recall hearing the sounder and even seeing it hug the coast from across the water and seeing the Edmunds Ferry making its course in front of my very eyes. Yup. The simple life of Whidbey is pretty sweet, if you're okay with being in a rural and somewhat remote place in the middle of nowhere. But my views changed soon after my 19th birthday. It wasn't late exactly, but because it was late in the year, the sun was nearly gone already. Luckily, it was also warm outside, still, and not raining. Thank God it was not raining. I used to live in Florida, on the complete opposite corner of the continental United States, and even if it rained there, it was warm. Here, the rain is fucking cold, and I protest nearly as bad as a cat that has to take a bath. Anyway, it was a pretty nice evening. I remember that I stayed on the cliff for nearly two hours maybe. I remember that because the sounder, the train that leaves downtown Seattle and goes up into Edmonds in the afternoons, usually makes its run from about 4pm to 6pm, and I remember hearing it choo-choo away and see it run up north along the coast of the mainland. Eventually, I headed back home. I had to in order to meet the person who wanted their computer back, with its old Pentium 4 and intimidating hyperfret technology. 
I still had to wait for a while longer before I finished business with that. And as I was going to do something else, I got a phone call. Me. Hello? Miss Neighbor. Uh, uh, to, to all mess? Me. Miss Neighbor? Everything all right? Miss Neighbor. No, oh, ha- having seashore. Me. I'm on my way. Running out of the door. I had a neighbor who suffered from a form of seizure, and since I was a local who worked at home practically, I got to be the one to call 911 and try to make things as good as possible for her. She had a child and a dog, and the child was hardly six, so keeping the mother in a position in a way where I did not have to fear her potential vomiting and keep the child emotionally calm and keeping the dog from investigating his owner. Things could be pretty stressful, especially since the nearest hospitals were either 40 minutes away or across the water. Either or, I always feared that whenever my neighbor closed her eyes, that it was, well, the last time she ever would. I happened to live on a cliffside, giving me the advantage on the time it took to get to her home, and usually in most cases, she is sitting up against the kitchen peninsula, and some plate with food fell on the floor. I always made sure to be super careful, and politely guide her to the couch, have her lay down on her side, and tell her to keep humming for as long as she can. I would make sure to tell her, over and over, like a broken record, that everything is going to be alright. I also did this when on the phone with 911. They even applauded me for my calm approach to this rather intense situation. I was expecting tonight to be similar, but fuck, I would have never guessed otherwise. The front door was closed, as always, and as I peered inside, I did not see my neighbor on the kitchen floor, like most of the time. Not out of the ordinary. Usually, she was either there or in her living room, struggling on the couch and being one step ahead of me. I open the door and immediately call out for her son. Nothing. Also not new. Many times he is too perplexed, trying to figure out why his mother seems ill. The dog, however, without fail, came running around the corner and ready to figuratively kill me, at least till he saw it was me. Then his tail wagged and began shaking his ass like a puppy would. He also happened to be trained to be a medical dog. So after asking, where is she boy? He led me to her bedroom on the second floor. This is when I noticed something was odd. I'll explain in the next post. She was on her bed, gasping for air. The room was a little cluttered, and her PC was on. These were the immediate things I saw, and like most would, I made sure she was conscious, put all her pillows, and even some of her clothes behind her, to prop her onto her side. I did not want her to vomit, and accidentally suffocate herself. From there, I cleaned up the room, aka moved everything to the walls, so when the ambulance came, it would be easier for them, and not trip on everything. I already was telling the person again what the street address was, and after she confirmed it was me, and the same person, the lady on the line, assured me that an ambulance was on the way. That just left me with finding her son, who I called for again, right before his mother gasped for air again, in between her hums. I knelt in front of her again, to make sure everything was alright, and she seemed to be trying to point to her computer, with that shaking limb of hers. She looked scared, and I do not blame her, I would be scared too so I quickly browsed the screen to see some tabs open. The screen was all weird, and the colors were off, like if someone had used a magnet and tried to use it like a cloth and wipe the monitor clean. But for the most part, everything was at least manageable to read. The tabs had Facebook, Google, YouTube, and what looked like a blog of some sort, and my neighbor was looking at Slenderman shit. In my mind, oh fuck, she scared herself shitless into the fucking coma. But as strange as that was, I still had to figure out where her son was, so I took one final glance at my neighbor, made sure everything was in check, and quickly ran across the hall and into his room, peered my head inside to see if he was there. Nothing. I looked at the bathroom, the living room, and kitchen again. Closets. Even the damn crawl space. Fucking nothing. And that is when I began to worry. Hardly five minutes went by when I left her alone, and she was still awake when I got back to her. I had asked her where she saw her boy last, And that is when she told me, I f- uh, he was with you. I didn't say anything, because I knew if I said no, or that could not be right, it could scare her even more. The thought that someone was here, and took her boy while she was undergoing a seizure, eyesight, hearing, all that shit would be hindered, if not gone, which led me to believe that someone must have taken him. Fuck me. Soon after the ambulance came, asked me a bunch of questions like always, and explained calmly, that everything for the most part was taken care of while they were on route. Next, they asked my neighbor some questions, got her onto the bed thing, and took her to the vehicle. 
They asked me if I wanted to come along, but I told them I was going to stay behind this time and that I was going to call her boyfriend and soon-to-be husband. Then she was gone, and my heart was racing for a couple of reasons. One, her son was still gone. Two, she thought that I was there already, or so I thought. Three, my neighbor's mate is an intimidating as fuck ex-marine, who is intimidating as fucking fuck fuck, and I had to call him to tell him what happened. I dial, and as I am walking back inside the door, that is when I see her son, and his scary as fuck dad, and he was holding a fucking gun. He asked me what had happened since I was there. I told him what I did, and managed to survive without soiling myself. He thanked me, and asked me to take their son to my place. Well, ordered it really, but it was said nicely and calmly, and I was not about to protest otherwise. My initial fear was fading away though. I was going to walk away from the house, with the marine who always intimidated me to no fucking end. The boy and I were heading back up the hill when he began telling me what had happened. At first, everything was cool. The boy was on my shoulders, and I was asking about how his preschool went and everything. Meanwhile, my mind was calming down. My neighbor must have mistook her boyfriend from me, and luckily, he was home too. I still wondered why the fuck he had the gun though, but fuck it. I was just glad to help my neighbor and be heading back home. I was gonna let him play Minecraft on my computer and get a bowl of Cocoa Puffs ready for him till either his dad picked him up or until he crashed asleep, whichever came first. But he began telling me what had happened, and I intentionally will not go into all the details because I am pretty sure the family I speak of do not want their names mentioned or give enough details for some reader to figure it out. But to hit you guys up with a synopsis, before my neighbor went into the seizure, her and her soon-to-be hubby must have gotten scared because apparently, the marine was shouting out the windows and doors with the gun at the ready. Or at least, this is what I am making out by the boy's limited vocabulary. We get to my home, nearly ten minutes up the hill, and everything else went smooth. I hear the music of zombies and creepers being slain by a sword in the hands of a child. I get WMMR, everything that rocks going, and two bowls of cereal ready for him and I. Eventually he crashed, my roomies came home, told them briefly what went down, and we all agreed that it is a highly unfortunate situation for our neighbors, and that everything gets better soon. But my mind still wondered about the gun, and why the fuck he was yelling towards the wilderness around his home. No slender man here, but it was on her damn computer, rest assured and on, lol. Much, much later, towards 11 o'clock at night, I wake up to gunfire, as did my roommates, and as much as I fucking hate myself for this, I allowed my roommates to talk me into going down to the fucking house. Longest fucking walk downhill. So I eventually fuckingly get there, in the dark, which does not help my confidence at all, and damn near get blinded with the motion sensor light device. The door was wide open, like all the way open, and at first I did not see it, but as I got closer, the small windows on the door were broken. I stepped back into the kitchen, and there was blood on the floor, the bar stools were knocked over, and even though I could only partially see the living room, that room was a fucking mess as well. I looked at my sides, see a baseball bat, pick that shit up, and did my best to calmly call out for my neighbor, the scary one, that is. Nothing. Get even more scared at this point. As much as I didn't want to advance any further, I eventually made it into the living room. From there I could see the back porch, not one in sight, least till I saw the ex-marine, with the gun fucking scared me shitless. I froze, and he luckily didn't kill me, but his eyes widened, and he used one hand to point at me. My heart could not have sunken any lower, because right then and there, I also heard the slight breaking of glass. Without thinking, without warning, without hesitation, I turned and threw that fucking bat at the doorway, and that is when I got the first glimpse of what was playing skirmish with my neighbor. No mythical beast or anything like that, but I still had a very good reason to be in fear. It was a man, wearing all black from head to toe, wielding what looked like a katana, only it was shorter. I think that is a tanto or something. He also had a mask on, which was mostly white, but it also had bits of what looked like shining metal. I got points for hitting him really well, because he grunted and ran back outside. The marine gets inside, and I must have seen his blood on the floor, because he was bleeding from the arm. Marine, Get the fuck out of here. Me. I heard gunfire. Marine. Fuck off, Anon. Me. You're fucking bleeding. Maybe he- Shh. We both fall to silence, 
and he must have forgotten to tell me to leave, because he was signaling me to follow with one hand, the other with the gun pointed to the bat. I get the bat. The bat and I become best buds. After all, it saved my sorry, scared to shit ass. We make it as far as the driveway, and for good measure, I pick up one of his trash can lights with my other hand. I was about to whisper, what should we do next? But it all went dark. All the lights in and around the house went out, and immediately the marine shouted, the circuit box. I ran with him, because fuck being alone in the dark was someone running around in a mask and having a blade. We're running back to the house. It's not even far away. We only walked like 20 yards maybe, and before we got back there, the lights are beginning to go back on, then off, like someone was messing with the master switch in the circuit box. The box was behind the house, and on the electrical post. I know, fucking weird, but this is Woodby. It's not uncommon to see the circuit box on a pole outside of a home. Hell, we even have painted doors that we planned besides the roads like they are our mailboxes. Anyway, back to the story. We run around to the back, and as we turn the corner, we see that fucker running to the other side of the house. The marine fires thrice, and he chases the dude. I'm right behind him. Just as we get to the next corner, my neighbor jumps backwards into the side. He was evading the blade that I talked about. The masked man was waiting right there to try and catch us in sprint. Now, I don't know how I did not shit myself, and I still was scared as fuck, but I can say I had some years in martial arts training and my fighting passion with armor and hito shields. So, with more or less words, I took the chance to punch with my shield and run into the man who was attacking my neighbor. All my attack did was draw the attention onto me because the attacker tried to hit me next. I drew my trash can lid back and turned my hips to whip the bat I had from behind me and crash the end of it onto the side of the fucker's head. I stepped back after that, just realizing that a person with a fucking knife made the marine bleed and my neighbor had a fucking gun. I lost my cool then. I was about to run before my neighbor shot again. He did not miss this time. My actions stunted the attacker just long enough. He didn't kill him either. He shot him in the foot to keep him from running away. More orders from my neighbor, and a few moments later, we strip the masked man and have him tied in the living room. Not too long after, the police arrived, and we explained everything. And in that process, we figured out that our attacker was meant to be in a ward this whole time. We clean up after that. I treated my neighbor's arm before the ambulance came. The cops stayed and took me home. Both my neighbors were at the hospital now. Their child was still sleeping and never was told. Nearly a week later, I asked the marine where his dog went. I learned that sissy was whimpering under the owner's bed when he was found. I still get shivers thinking about this shit, but I am getting enough courage to speak out. In the aftermath, my neighbor still undergoes seizures, but they became rare. She was improving, and now is doing well. I eventually moved off island and returned to the mainland, and everything and everyone seems to be happy and moved on. What still stumps me is why the fuck would my neighbor even look at Slenderman's shit, let alone why that crazed pillhead went after my neighbors. He never did tell me when asked or interrogated.